Hey everyone, Corey from the YouTube Grind here to talk about business. I know earlier today we talked about YouTube, but I do like to talk about business as well. And I know a lot of you guys own your own business and things like that. I'm going to answer a question I get 10 times a day. And that is, why doesn't my main business, which is the Aquarium Co-op, ship fish online? Now, if you're not a fish person, that might sound crazy to you because like, oh, people ship fish. But you are a fish person, then... Uh, you're kind of like, why wouldn't you do that? You have all of this infrastructure. You have uh, all this following. Clearly, people want to buy. And that's what it comes down to is making money. So let me let me put some things in perspective. So I wouldn't be the only one selling online. We have competitors, right? So let's say there's Live Fish Direct. Let's say there's uh, Invertebrates by Mrs. Jinx. There's Flip Aquatics. There's, let's say... 50 companies selling fish online. Now, uh, I have to compete with them. Where I am based out of, which is Washington State, you know, if you look at the United States map, we're way up in a corner. That's our first disadvantage. Uh, anyone who is more centrally located in the United States are going to get better shipping rates. So when I need to ship a fish, and typically fish, you want them in the mail the least amount of time possible, if I'm way up here and most of the clientele, well, I just know from knowing statistics is in the Midwest, I have to ship a lot further. If you're based in the Midwest, a lot of your stuff overnights for cheaper just because it's smaller jumps. And if you got to ship all the way to Florida, it's like, you know, two days less shipping, same all the way up to Seattle where I'm at, same down to Texas. And so you're more centrally located. So that's the first advantage that a lot of businesses are going to have over me. Just straight up, they've got that. I have that disadvantage. So that's pretty easy to understand. And so much so, I do sell dry goods online, and those businesses have the same advantages being in the middle of the United States. So that is already one disadvantage my business has. Now, the other disadvantage is that essentially our minimum wage is – I can't stop looking at my hair. It just looks weird in, under this light at the moment. But um, – the disadvantage I have is essentially our minimum wage is $15. And so not by law, but when McDonald's, Chick-fil-A, Home Depot, they're all offering $14.50 or more to start, you can't hire anyone to work in a warehouse for less than $15. Like it's just not going to happen. So that's the other disadvantage I have is I've got a $15 minimum wage where in the Midwest might be as low as 8 or $9. So you've got a logistical issue. And then you've got that actual monetary issue. So let's say, like, because obviously I'm selling dry goods and stuff like that online and we're turning a profit. Um, so obviously I'm able to make this model work. But live things like fish require lots of care to upkeep. Uh, so it's going to skew the results. So I might need to... Okay, let me back it up here. I know there's a lot of demand because when we did sell online, I've done it twice now. Once when I very first opened my business in the first year and then once again probably about a year and a half ago. The first time I did it, we would sell out of all the stuff we brought into the store virtually overnight and it was angering the retail customers. They'd walk in, there'd be a lot of post-it notes on tanks going, hey, you've sold all this stuff online. Why do I even bother coming into your store? So that was a problem. So then the space I'm in now, it's a separate building filled with fish tanks. We said, okay, we're going to put all the fish in here. We're going to sell from there. And we, we only sold high-end fish. And it was insane demand. So it very well, before we sold high-end fish, we go, well, let's try some live bears again. And I put out a video that said, hey, we're selling fish. And all the fish on the website sold out in under two hours. And so then the rest of the internet was angry for the next three days going, I didn't even get to see you were selling it before you'd already sold out. When are you going to have more? So unfair. You know, you're doing horrible things, blah, blah, blah. So then we morphed it again and we tried only selling kind of high-end goldfish and bettas and that type of thing. And then it was we were taking pictures and videos of each one and we'd sell it. And then people that were paying this high-end money would say, oh, it's a different fish or I didn't want this one. Can I return it? Um, and things like that. So that wasn't working out either. And so we get to the point where I am now, 
and there's insane demand. Everyone wants to buy, but why do people want to buy? They want to buy because the way we do business, and that is never leave a customer dissatisfied, take care of them, sell top quality, don't compromise your morals, that type of thing. That's the way our business is set up. Now, when we do fish, I have to do it the same way because I don't want to just be like, well, we'll do well in this part of the business and treat the other part like crap. We can't do that. And so that means I need to set up a couple of warehouses. And I forgot the other part is because minimum wage is so high, retail or not even retail, but warehouse space is very expensive here too. And so what might cost me $4,000 might cost someone $750 for the same amount of space in the Midwest. So that's another cost to make it make sense. Um, so there's that to add on there. But I don't want to compromise my morals. Like, well, people are like, well, couldn't you just do it? Like, just ship them out. Like, I, a lot of people say, won't you make an exception for me and ship me fish? I won't even complain if they arrive dead. Won't if, I won't do this. I won't do that. And it's not even whether you care or not. It's about the fact that when you talk to your friend, you're like, yeah, well, we got this fish. And, Six out of eight made it alive. Like that's not what we even want to be in the realm of mentioned with Aquarium Co-op. And so it needs to be six out of eight made it alive. But then they sent me three more on their own dime and made it up 110%. And man, they're doing a great job. And it's really hard to do when I'm being undermined by the warehouse space costs more, the employees cost more, and um, I forget what the third one is. There's, so what was it? Oh, in location, the shipping rates. And so the other weird part about my business is um, I think I was looking at it last night or the night before looking at analytics. I spent somewhere around, let's see, $12,000. At this point, I've spent about $120,000 with USPS shipping stuff out. And because I'm in Seattle and there's Amazon and there's Google – and there's Microsoft, and there's Boeing. There's all these giant super corps, right? 120 grand in shipping. I'm not even on their radar. The uh, shipping facilities are so overworked, or, or like so overstuffed with mail moving around, they're not offering me any discounts. Where if I was to be in, you know, Idaho, Montana, Ohio, any of those places. That kind of spend, 120 grand, would get me wicked good. Well, I'm not gonna say wicked good, but I'd be getting discounts. And uh, here, it's laughable. It's laughable. They want me to do what is it? They want me to do. Um, yeah, what's the number? I know the number is something astronomical, crazy that I'm not even close to touching. I think it's. I think they wanted me before they started giving me breaks to spend sixty thousand a month. Which I'm only at twelve thousand, so I'd have to increase my business fivefold to start getting discounts, and so that becomes one of those things. Like it literally would be cheaper for me to move my entire business and operation than it is to really hit that number, and so it's kind of crazy. So I've got all these things working against me, and that really becomes apparent when you're trying to ship things like live fish. And so what it comes down to is of the things I touch, which is live plants, fish, dry goods, frozen foods, live foods, like of those things, it really only makes sense. Well, profit-wise, plants and dry goods, they make sense. After I pay my employees, I pay the retail space, I do all those kinds of things, I still, there's a profit at the end. But if I was to ship frozen foods, uh, basically anything that needs to be overnighted, frozen foods, live bacteria, live foods, live fish, all those have to be overnighted the uh, shipping is so cost prohibitive that it is a detriment to the business. So I could maybe, let's say I do another million dollars worth of selling fish. I would like at the end, you're like, you made $12,000. Meanwhile, I had way more liabilities with insurance. I have more liabilities with warehouses. I have way more overhead. I have to manage six more employees. Let's say you've got all these things to make $12,000, which might seem like a lot if you don't own a business, but $12,000 profit to a business, it, we should be able to tweak something else to make that up easier. And that's what I typically do is like, well, I could add another product line, like a dry good, or I could you know, make more videos and sell more stuff, that type of thing. And so that's why we haven't gone down that realm. 
Um, and I do encourage others. There, you know, if you are in the right part of the country to do that or the part of the world, great, do it. It just doesn't make sense where I'm at. And uh, so I haven't found, I haven't given up, but I haven't found a way to hack my way to be profitable. So, you know, usually you try to use an environmental factor that helps your business. So it's location. Maybe if you're in Florida, you get free heat. So now you're just, you're keeping fish in a, in a greenhouse as opposed to a warehouse. Maybe you can get away with that in California as well. So you use something like that. So either you're getting free heat or you're getting cheap water or location for shipping is going to let you hack your way through it. You know, there's all those things that unfortunately I don't get to take advantage of any of those. And so I kind of, you know, I'm not going to say like, Oh, I've got it so rough. But I am at a disadvantage where I am currently uh, because being that my business is online for the most part and I make YouTube videos, I could do that in any state. It just happens to be I'm in one that costs a lot of money. So um, that's why I don't ship fish. I've tried it a couple of times. People ask me when am I going to ship fish and my answer lately has been like never. Like until there's some groundbreaking thing that allows me to pull it off. Um, which it could happen like uh, UPS is trying to get more competitive. They've got a flat rate shipping uh, solution that's going to come out that tries to compete with USPS. And when that happens, there might be a shift where I could make that happen. And as a byproduct of that, FedEx might get more competitive. So there's things that could happen. But as the current landscape, it is a lot of work and infrastructure building you know, sort of build out warehouses and stuff. I'm going to spend way more money than the 12000 a year I'm going to get back or whatever nominal thing it is. Um, so, yeah, that's that's the logistical problem with my business. So, um, yeah, USPS is way cheaper currently, but UPS knows that, and they're doing what they can to start competing with it, and they're launching a product that's supposed to be in line or cheaper it's also going to be flat rate, just like USPS is, which is what most companies are shipping with now. Well, I won't say most companies. There's a lot of companies that ship like UPS ground, USPS ground, that ship things and it takes, well, you know when stuff takes like two weeks to get to you? That's because people are using ultra cheap shipping. I can't use that for live plants. And in a day and age where you're competing with Amazon, you can't ship and have it take nine to 14 days. It has to get there in two or three days. That's just... If you want to keep customers, unless you're the only person on the planet that sells that one-of-a-kind item or whatever it is, people will choose someone who ships faster. That's just how the world works. So, uh, Glass Boxes asks, used to ship live fish, what are some examples of nightmare orders or, or situations? So, the other part, let's say financially... I would be profitable by selling fish. The other part is when you sell a live animal, people are much more attached to it. And what I mean by that, if I ship a snail and it arrives dead for some reason because it got lost in the mail, you go, okay, yeah, a snail died, send me another one. But if I send you a goldfish or a betta or something like that that you had your heart set on and it dies in the mail, you're very angry that now I have killed your animal or your pet, uh, something like that. So if that was to happen, that was traumatic. And what, what, what I mean by traumatic is there might be 20 or 30 email exchanges from that. So now you're investing half an hour, an hour versus you know consoling a customer, reshipping it at a loss, paying for the shipping again. And my company, we always shipped at our cost. If you go on to a lot of these companies, they'll refund your money for the fish, but not for the shipping. And to me, that just, that compromises my morals and my business ethic of like, we want people to love aquarium co-op. And every time a fish arrives dead and then we go, I realize you took the day off work to receive this fish and you paid $45 to overnight it to you. And the fish itself costs $50. We're willing to give you your $50 back but the $45 we're not going to get back and the whole day of work you missed, you're out of luck there as well. That doesn't go over well with people. So the other one, uh, we shipped out some goldfish and the person got them. They arrived at their house and then they sent an email like, okay, what do I do now? 
Uh, and it turns out they had an aquarium, but it didn't even have water in it. They they'd never set one up. They literally knew nothing. They just bought expensive goldfish and said, hey, ship it out. And then they blamed us for for shipping them sick fish. Meanwhile, this person didn't know how to care for a fish. And so, you know, maybe it was the fact that a completely uncycled aquarium with too much food going in gave them ick and ammonia burns and things like that. But instead, we got trashed on the internet for it, and it was all our fault, and we're horrible people. And in, even in that instance, I refunded all of their money um, just because it, it was the easiest way out, you know. Basically, oh, you're stealing my money, blah, blah, blah. You're killing everything. It's all our fault. It's easier to, like, refund the money after you've tried to make things right and do all that and move on and focus on making money somewhere else. And that's basically shipping fish in a nut nutshell. I can make money in other spaces easier, so why wouldn't you go there? And that's for any business. If it's really hard to sell, you know, if you're a, if you sell pens, and an inkwell and you know a pen is way hard to ship versus a big pen or a pencil or a drafting pencil or any of these other things. Go into those avenues instead of fixating on why can't I ship this one product? Go find two or three other things you can do that will offset all of the the money you were gonna get. So, like for instance, when I traveled down, when I when I realized shipping fish is not gonna work, I really wanted to see how can I ship frozen foods to people. And no matter what way I spin that one, to do it correctly, which in my opinion, I haven't seen a company doing it correctly yet, you need to ship it with dry ice. The problem with dry ice is every shipment that goes out has to have a hazardous sticker, can only go on certain planes, and that type of thing. And so you're either A, lying when you ship it, and you're shipping a hazardous material without telling someone, or B, you're hoping it'll be cold enough. Now... In the middle of winter, it probably is cold enough. Put a couple of frozen packs in with it, ship it out, and as long as it's frozen all around the country, it does okay. But the other 60% of the year, they're going to be half thawed, and it probably won't kill the fish, but it's also not best either. And a lot of companies just play to that. Like, well, if the customer doesn't complain, you know, is it really a problem? And that's kind of that, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and no one can hear it, did it actually fall? Did it actually make a sound? And to me... Just because a customer doesn't complain, if I know I could do it better, I'm still at fault. Going, ah, we that can be done better. I'm choosing not to for a monetary thing. Um, so I, I honestly do try my best. And that's for all facets of my business. And it works well so far uh, in everything I'm trying to do. So uh, let's see here. So LR Brett's Aquatics does ship live fish and shrimp and stuff like that and he says it's not easy to ship easy to ship fish take some care especially uh if they're your babies uh best know what you're doing if you're shipping fish yeah it's it's a skill set for one you got to be able to teach employees to do all that that kind of stuff and you know someone for like lr bretts he's much more centrally located which is a big boon uh as opposed to being stuck in one of the corners so you know again a logistical thing So Nick K says, true stuff, even with my small, or my bad, didn't say small, with my service business, uh, I call it the bread and butter, quick and easy money, why take the time-consuming pain jobs instead? Right. Really, you should only chase after the lowest end profits after you've really determined there's no other easy money or avenues to be taken advantage of. So let's say it's been five years from now, and... I'm dominating all the space I think I can dominate, and I, for whatever reason, want to torture myself and grow even bigger. Then that would be a time to tackle fish. Or let's say, for whatever reason, I want to make a dramatic impact on the hobby, and I want to show everyone how it could be done, and maybe I take that under my wing. That would be a time to do it instead of uh, you know, taking it under now. Like it would be a philanthropy project instead of a business project at that point. So... Uh, is it cheaper and safer to ship with actual airlines like Alaska, American, and United? Uh, it's not cheaper. Well, it depends. So, like, let's say we were going to ship, I don't know any packages sitting around, but a package like this big, right? I could ship that overnight to your door for about 45 bucks. If I put it on a plane, one, i got to drive to the airport. Two, uh, it's probably going to cost you about 55 60 bucks to get it 
from the airport and then you have to drive to the airport. So while it is a quicker flight, it's an inconvenience for both parties. Now, the good thing is if I was shipping you a box this big that's just huge with, you know, a thousand dollars worth of fish, when you go to pick that box up at the airport, it's only gonna cost you like seventy five dollars as opposed to fifty five or sixty five. So if you buy insane amounts of fish, that makes sense. That being said, both people still had to drive to an airport. And what people forget, even though I only live about 40 minutes away from an airport, there are plenty of people in the United States or even in the world that are like, yeah, to get to the airport, four hours. You know, that's four hours each way. So it's not – and when you want a service, you know, that's, that's a whole other headache when you can say, I sell live fish only to airport. Then you're just flooded with emails of people going, well, it's too far of a drive to my airport. Uh, the other things we would get all the time is, I can't use USPS at my my house. They are just too bad. They always kill stuff. They drop it. They lose it. I need you to send FedEx, or I need you to do this. And the logistical thing, nightmare of that, when it comes to packing software and planning shipments when they're getting picked up and dropped off, and you know, trying to we already established at twelve thousand dollars. I'm laughable. If I was to split that up over three different companies, I'm really laughable. Each company's going, you're only spending $4,000. You're really a nobody to us. And so you really want to try and leverage that so that at a certain point, if I can get a discount, I can pass that discount along to all my customers, and then I get to be more competitive with more people or more competitors. So uh, let's see here. Trying to see. I think, by the way, uh, Jarden Aquatics is putting together a calendar. I think Jimmy may have submitted some photos. If not, he is working on them and will submit them at this point. Um, so I'm not sure if that has hit Jarden Aquatics yet. Do we have any business related questions, maybe to your guys' own businesses, before I wrap this up? I kind of just wanted to make this video so that I can link this video and other people can link this video when. 10 times a day, obviously, why don't you ship fish? And I said, you know what? I'm going to the business channel. I'm going to talk about this. And uh, business people will get it. Most of the public will still just be like, ah, sounds like he's lazy or he's making excuses. And and I am. I am lazy and I'm making excuses because I could physically do it. It could be done. But working for no profit is usually a good way to put a business out of business because eventually – what do you mean that warehouse caught on fire? What do you mean it flooded? What do you mean it damaged other property and that kind of stuff? And then you have like this giant bill uh, for property damage that was making you no money anyway. So uh, let's see. What is this last one? I would love, I would love to hear your opinion of the tanks scapes instead of music. Just my opinion. I think that's meant for a different video or a different uh, commenter because I don't believe that's targeted me. Uh, let's see here. Looks like, oh, 70 trucks and 30 cargo vans. That's, that's a lot. That's a lot of stuff moving around. My company runs 100 routes at night for, or a night for Amazon. They're taking over the world. Yeah, it. so that is like a, a literal thing. I know here for Amazon and uh, they literally have, I believe, and I haven't done my research lately in the last probably three or four months, but they have giant distribution centers with, I don't know, thousands of delivery trucks that are still sitting there. They're not delivering because I don't think the contract with the USPS is up yet. But when that's up, Amazon the problem is, so this is a legit problem, in at least certain areas like Seattle where Amazon's based, uh, Amazon's doing so much business that USPS can't keep up. And so USPS delivers on Sundays here. I don't know if it's everywhere, but here they do. But they're actually contracted workers that only work for Amazon and they make way less money than an actual USPS worker does uh, because they're contracted. But you can get... Uh, you know, Amazon stuff delivered on a Sunday here, but you can't get your normal mail. So even if you're like, you're a mailman, like why can't you bring it to me? Because they're not being paid to do that. They're only delivering uh, Amazon packages. And I just know they have giant distribution centers, infrastructures there. I think they're just waiting for a contract to end to go boom. All right, now, um, you know, now we're going to use our own people. Because I know, I know a couple people that deliver 
for Amazon. And they do the type of items that, like, let's say you bought, um, like, a 72-inch big screen TV off Amazon and you paid the extra $200 to get it shipped overnight. That goes in the back of someone's Ford Transit Connect and they drive it seven hours to you and they don't make money on it. But it's the fact that it happened and you're going to tell the story and it, you know, your, your TV broke the day before the Super Bowl and your new TV got there and you lived in the middle of nowhere and it saved the Super Bowl and now you love Amazon. They're willing to run it at a loss to make sure they dominate all their competitors. So they've been doing that for a long time. All right. Um, what are the biggest non-shipping challenges of shipping fish, like prepackaged stage dilemmas? So part of it is uh, you got to fast the fish. So when a fish sells, you then need to fast it for two or three days. And you don't know necessarily know when the fish is going to sell. So there's a, a delayment period there. And then there's also like you got to factor in, well, we delay it for three days. I can't ship it out on a on a Thursday because that might get caught up and not get delivered on a Sunday. There's all these types of things like that. So scheduling becomes difficult. And then what we ran into is a lot of people wanted special orders. Like we bought it, but we don't want you to ship it till next week or we're buying it and you have to write on the package, please keep it post office, call this phone number or, uh, you know, make sure to leave by back door or leave in the building next door at the office. And so you've got all these little special things that are supposed to be written on all these different packages and if you forget one, you're basically at fault and everything dies. If you mix two of them up, that same thing happens. And so it was really meticulous packing procedures that took a lot of time. Like, was this the guy that wanted? Oh, no, he wanted that. Okay. Oh, she needs this to happen. Oh, God, it's in the box. But no, it can't ship till Wednesday. That, that's right. That note says only Wednesday. And uh, whereas, like, you ship this bottle... This isn't time sensitive. I can ship it out today or Wednesday, and when it lands to you, if it sat for an extra day, it doesn't die. So you get to avoid all those pitfalls as well when it's not like a super live good. So uh, Brandon says we've got a 125 square foot, 125 k, so 125 thousand square foot warehouse in Denver that's like 90 k a month. Um, yeah, so that's actually a you know like in Seattle. That would be insane. That's a, you know, that's a, I mean, Denver's a big, well, Denver's a pretty big hub. So that seems like a great rate because Denver, Colorado is blowing up. If you haven't been to Denver, Colorado lately, definitely a lot of people are moving in. I've been there the past five years or so because uh, Greg Sage lives there. I visit him and I've seen that place really develop. Downtown, like Denver, Colorado is hopping with 20 somethings and 30 somethings. Business is moving to Denver, Colorado. I don't know if it's, um, you know, their taxation structure or whatever it is, but definitely people are there. And uh, so, yeah. Uh, he also says, we run line hauls from Seattle Distribution and Phoenix to here in Denver. Yeah, like it's it's a crazy amount of network that goes on. And that's just why I can't really bargain much with my spend is because the hubs that we have are already over capacity and giving a discount. It, they're in the same thing I am, basically. It's like, why would we give you a discount or why would we sell fish when it would lose us money? You know, we're already overworking and over capacity. It doesn't make sense until you basically have to leverage it. We're like, well, I'm going to take my half million dollars I spend with you and I'm going to go to USPS or UPS if you don't. That might get their attention. Like, okay, well, here's a 5% discount. You know, something like that, which 5% is a decent amount in shipping. Um, you know, always want more for sure. Uh, let's see here. Nick's at the point where I have the demand, but by the time I pay an extra employee and the work involved, the benefit of the profit isn't that great, but will help grow the business. So in those situations, Nick, my advice to people is to start raising your prices, which the public never wants to hear. Business owners typically say the public won't pay it. The goal is to, let's say, you know, next year you go, I'm going to raise my prices by 10%. So if a job was $70, now it's $77. 
and knowing that you'll probably lose 10 or 20 percent of your overall business that being said you will make 10 percent more on the jobs you are doing and let's say you lost 20 percent of your business you're going oh my god it's horrible right but that will now free you up for some more marketing and you'll be able to source either more ways to save money on that job or more high quality jobs and a lot of like like my uncle's a plumber and I know a lot of other businesses that are like one guy plus some help and they do like a service based business every year your rate should kind of be going up and unless you don't have enough work if you don't have enough work don't raise your rate but if you're always like oh man it seems like I'm always full of work that's a sign you're selling it too cheap and a lot of people are very honest hard workers and they don't want to take advantage of people and really they just don't realize they're taking advantage of themselves because there's plenty of other corporations that are really taking advantage of people And if you know your work is good and you will be fair to that customer and you will make sure the job is done right that already is better than most other companies and if I like that's my perfect candidate you'll do exactly what you say you'll make sure it gets done and you're not gonna grossly overcharge me I will gladly pay you 10% more so that you can make sure that happens as opposed to like well I'm running a couple employees so I'm gonna you know just kind of cut corners a little bit to make things happen so my advice is raise your prices um, until there's not enough work and that you can always back off you can always make yourself cheaper again but most often most small businesses are not charging enough because they want to compete with big business so what happens is you're focusing so hard on competing with big business on their price forgetting that you're absolutely destroying them on how you take care of the customer like your customer satisfaction rate is through the roof and theirs is not but you're still trying to offer the same product at the same price or you're trying to offer a better product at the same price and that's usually never a good strategy long term my experiences with third-party shippers like uh, Teespring Amazon so far I've been displeased with all third-party shippers I've worked with so far which is Amazon and Teespring um, the problem the problem is they don't have my same work ethic they are so they become an extension of my business without um, me having any control over it so I ship out everything priority everything Teespring ships things out the slowest way possible so you order a shirt if you order it from my specific store it'll be to you within three days like guaranteed you order from Teespring two weeks plus easy right so that doesn't really like that gives a bad user experience they're gonna go oh if I order plants because most your average person doesn't realize that it's not me shipping it right same thing with Amazon Amazon they're they're a taxation issue by me selling things on Amazon unless I, I set up a different LLC kind of a shell corporation over there and sell items on Amazon that's and so aquarium co-op would sell items to aquarium co-op number two which aquarium co-op number two only sells stuff on Amazon because once you sell stuff on Amazon anywhere they have a warehouse becomes a nexus for you and anyone in business knows that means you basically have to pay sales tax in every one of those states so that's it's everything comes with its own its own logistical problems its own profit problems its own quirks to go with it so uh, tank grown Rick said if someone paid you four hundred dollars to ship a forty dollar fish would you do it uh, very large profit no I turn every single one of them down uh, the only time I make exceptions is when I have done paid consulting with someone in a face-to-face -face interaction just like this so it's one-on-one -on -one, and they've got problems in their tank and they really need something I will make an exception for that because I only have a one-on-one -on -one connection and they know I will do everything in my pos possible you know everything in my ability to get them a healthy fish and they know I'm trying to help them and I have sized them up to be a reasonable person that's the only time so it's very 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 few people that ever get to do that money is not the driving factor you know I I would wager a few people in this chat have very successful businesses I consider my business to be pretty successful and at a certain point money is not a driving factor I, I ran into some of this when I told people business consulting is two hundred dollars an hour and hobbyist consulting is a hundred dollars an hour and they go oh it must be nice to make this money and blah blah, blah. and I tried to explain to them that money 
I don't do it because I want the money. I do it because I want to help people. So if I work, so here it is, you know, 9.30 at night for me today. I started at 8 a.m. and I'm still going to work another few hours. When I sell my consulting time like that, I'm selling the precious hours that I would have eaten dinner with my wife, gone and visited my grandmother, done all these other things, right? And so, you know, if you work 16 hours a day, you've got eight hours for sleep and family. So that means you sleep five or six hours and you spend two or three hours with family. You're either buying some of my sleep or you're buying some of my family time. And to me, at the, at the rate I make money, I value that actually much higher than $200. So that's where I was trying to say like, this is the lowest amount of money I can charge a business or a hobbyist and really help them without being way too detrimental to what I'm doing. So um, really, the, the people that have bought the business service are like, you should be charging way more. You know that I've paid way more for this. And I go, I know, but I actually want to help people. And I do enjoy what I do. If I, you know, if it was like $200 an hour to go dig a ditch, I'd be like, mm, yeah, I'm not really down with digging ditches, especially after a 16 hour workday. So uh, let's see here. Do I think shipping fish as a concept is flawed or unethical? Uh, I don't think it's in, in itself it's unethical. I think there are definitely people being unethical in the way they do it, but done correctly, it is ethical. I 100% agree with that. Um, the concept's not flawed so long as you have a good location, you've got the right manpower or woman power, you've got the right staff, right location, right shipping rates, so that you don't have to cheat other corners, you know, and cheating other corners might be, well, I'm going to ship it with a heat pack that only lasts 24 hours instead of 72 hours because that saves me 50 cents. Well, I'm going to use this cheaper insulation because it saves me another 50 cents. Well, I'm going to use this type of bag because it saves me a quarter. Now you've saved $1.25, but the profit margins are so thin on that stuff that $1.25 actually makes a big difference. And so that's what you kind of really need to focus on is can I make this a profit center? If it's not profitable, you won't be able to take care of your customers. If you can't take care of your customers, it then becomes a flawed uh, business by design and will not be sustaining long term. Uh, how do you find shipping on the inside, ordering fish from suppliers? How do you find... So shipping into me, I find them to be very reasonable because I'm ordering big amounts. So if I order $5,000 in fish to my store, well, not to my store, but to the airport, and I go pick it up and it's $200, that's great. Where if I order a $20 pair of guppies from someone that lives in Florida, shipping's 45 bucks, you know? So it's in the mass quantities that make sense. The same thing, like if I ask you to deliver a carton of ice cream across the country, you're going, uh, that's going to cost like $3,000. Like that's a lot of money. But if you drive an entire semi full of ice cream, maybe that sells for $4,000 and you make a profit. So it's all about volume. And that's why it works when sh fish are getting shipped to a store. Uh, let's see here. I think that might be, if, unless anyone's got any questions. I've heard Seattle is heavy union state due to the ports. Is that true and does it affect me in any way? Uh, okay, so I don't think it affects me other than maybe it pushes up minimum wage a little bit, but you know, just because better jobs are available. Um, so it hasn't affected me that I know of. And I don't feel like it, problem is I've only ever lived in Seattle or Washington, so like I don't feel like per capita, like, you know, obviously, well, I won't say obvious, but like there's going to be like nursing unions, teacher unions, uh, like uh, grocery store unions, iron workers unions, port unions, like a lot of stuff is union, but I think it's pretty much unionized mostly throughout the United States. I could be wrong. could be like, you know, Idaho's a ghost town. Like, oh, you're, you're not part of the iron workers union or something like that for all I know. I have no idea. But I don't see, seem to see it impacting me much. It does impact me. Like for a while, I think, um, was it China? China's ports were on strike. Went for a couple weeks. That definitely affected me 
in a roundabout way. I was I didn't have that much stuff coming from China, but a lot of my suppliers had stuff coming from China. So their warehouse is sat empty while my warehouse sat empty while we're waiting for stuff sitting out on uh, out on boats and not moving around much and doing stuff like that. So yeah, it can, but not not too much affects me. So Jordan Aquatic says money is no longer my driving force in my business. The time I spend with my family has become priceless. So yeah, Jordan, you you definitely get that aspect. Like you. Most businesses, we start with we're only focused on money because we have to be, and then you get to a point where you're actually making enough money to live and then some. And then you realize, I can chase more money, but time is the only thing you really can't buy more of. If you make $500,000 a year, you can pretty much buy anything but time. And so, I mean, obviously, I don't make that much money, but I make enough that I don't go, oh man, how am I going to eat tomorrow? Or how am I going to pay my mortgage? Or how am I going to get a fish tank? I've got money to cover all that. And so it, it starts becoming like, man, what if I was to go visit someone? Or what if I was to go watch a movie or do those types of things? Those start being the things I long to do. I long like, oh man, you went, like one of my, one of my honest things, I want to go camping so bad. Because camping, you're away from technology and I don't worry about business at all, and I haven't done it in like two years, and I really want to go do it, but I, I magically never find the time. Well, I gotta go do this, well, I gotta go do that. So, yeah, I can definitely see where you're coming from on that. Uh, would you ship fish if hire a competent employee to primarily focus on shipping fish, assuming you won't lose money to help people? Emphasis on helping people. There, There is a series of events where two or three employees really want to make it their own thing and we find the right warehouse space and it seems like a good idea. There is a series of events where that probably could happen, but it really would take some people coming to me and really wanting to make that happen as opposed to me making that happen. If that makes any sense. Like if I had employees, they were all working for me for a few years and they go, you know what? We really should do this. Me and X we want to spearhead this project. You just got to put up the money. You got to rent the warehouse. You got to build the facility. You know, and by build it, I mean pay for it. Like they would build it. They would get it all done before we would train new people to replace them so that we didn't lose the business over there. I'd be receptive to that. But it would take at least minimum two or three people that really wanted to do it because if you go into that big of an expansion with one person that wants to do it and then it turns out they can't do it or they get sick or they get a divorce or they have a baby or any of these things that are like game enders, you now have a big expansion in your business that no one wants to touch with a 10-foot pole. So there have to be a few people very passionate about it uh, to make it happen. So Lloyd Parsons asks, what's the best way to open a business? Do you have a business in mind, Lloyd? Like That makes it a lot easier because I think it's specific to, you know, if you want to open a tattoo parlor, is much different than a fish store, than a grocery store, than a McDonald's. Um, so if you have a specific business you're thinking about, we could talk about that. So is helping other people really the only benefit I would get out of shipping fish then, just because of the headache and the heartache it causes you? I'm not going to be pompous enough to say the only benefit, but I would say that would be the main driving factor. Like it would have to make money but I would have to really be changing the industry and changing people's lives to want to do that much work for that little money. And that sounds like a real selfish statement, but that's what businesses are. They're selfish. I'm here to make money because if you don't focus on that, you're a nonprofit, really. You're, you're trying to do something else. And so I have to make money and it helps me do what I want to do. That being said, like by Aquarium Co-op doing what it does, it easily helps me go, yeah, you guys should all go buy from LR Brett's Aquatics or Flip Aquatics or Inverse Bry Majinx or this person or that person. Like, I don't have to be the person that does it all. I can also help promote other people that are doing segments I'm not doing. And in fact, by not doing it all, I can work with more people because they're not competitors, right? So it's easier to work with someone that's not trying to do exactly what you're doing. Uh, let's see. So it looks like Lloyd is wanting to start a fish business because it says, how many tanks did you have when it started? Uh, me personally, in my home, I ran about 50. Uh, but the store, 
I started with uh, 42 aquariums. My, my main wall was 42 aquariums. I bought them all used. And uh, I bought them from businesses going out of business, stores going out of business. And for opening a fish store, the best thing I can tell you is just go watch my one-hour presentation on the Aquarium Co-op channel about opening up a fish store. That's going to give you a lot of advice. And then if you have questions after that, specific questions, we can talk about those. But otherwise, I'm just rehashing that video. Um, but there are a lot of things like counting traffic, picking the right location, uh, stuff that I don't cover in detail but would take a long time to explain here. So, Here's a question for you. What is the process you took in the beginning to take the leap, such as how do you afford the debt as well as pay your bills, buy food, etc.? So Joseph, I would only enter into a business if I had no debt, which – it seems crazy because everyone assumes you go into debt to open a business. But I had no interest in my life going into debt to do this because I knew it wasn't a big money-making thing. So if I know I'm going to work really hard to not make as much money as if I opened up a Subway or a Pizza Hut or you know, I don't know the profit margin specifically on those, but I know I, I would be a much better CFO or CEO of another company that just paid me a retarded, well, I won't say retarded, a ridiculous amount of money uh, to just make sure their profits get enough and enough people got fired and that kind of stuff. So if money was my driving factor, Corporate World and Corey, we matched up great. I'm a hard worker. I'm, I'm reasonably smart. Uh, so what happened was customers day in, day out would say, like, why don't you just open your own business? You're being hamstrung where you are. You could do more. You could do better. And I'd be like, yeah, but I'm a I'm a 28 year old dude that works at a fish store. I don't have that kind of money. And eventually, one of my friends who did have that kind of money said, "You know, I think you should open up a fish store. I'm willing to put up the money." And so they were willing to put up money, which was they put up fifty thousand dollars cash. And I went into the contract with them saying, "I will only do this is if I fail, I owe you nothing." So that means they had to be an angel investor. For that trade, they got 25% of my business. So even right now, as, as successful as we are, 25% of all the profit I ever make goes to him. And I'm thankful to him every day for it because without someone going, I'm willing to give you 50 grand cash, no questions asked. If it fails, you owe me nothing. I would not have taken the leap because I didn't want to be 30 or 32 and up to filing bankruptcy and then waiting till I'm 40 to be able to buy a house and that kind of stuff. So, uh, and then, so that was only half of my money procurement. Then I still like, I knew 50 grand wasn't enough, but it was enough to get the ball rolling. Then I had another friend who I, both these friends, well, no, this, this second friend I befriended through the fish store. They were a good customer. They happened to be a finished carpenter by trade. They ran and worked in pet stores for many, many years when they were younger. And I thought his skill set was great to build a fish store. He was receptive to building it. And that deal there was he was willing to do all of the work on loan. So it cost me about $50,000 in material that he donated a little bit of material. Well, I don't know about a little bit, but some material and all of his time. And then I had to pay it back over two years. Uh, so that was basically $100,000 to get me started, and I was in no debt. Well, let me back that up. And if my business failed, I owed him nothing either. But they, both these people were so confident that I was so good at my job already. Like I was already running a fish store. I was so good at it. They looked at it going, it couldn't possibly fail. I mean, not couldn't possibly, but the odds were so low. Now, a lot of other people thought I was crazy, and now all of those people – routinely they, they'll drop hints like, you know, if you ever need any money for any project you want to do, just just let me know. Like I'd like to get in on that because they realize I work really hard and what I touch turns into more money. And so now plenty of money can come my way. Uh, but so how did I get through not making any money? Uh, I had a spouse, you know, well, fiance or not wasn't, I don't even think it was fiance at the time. No, it was. Fiance at the time, uh, we lived off one income. We've always been very frugal. And even now, 
I mean, I'm less frugal than I was, but I've always been pretty darn frugal and I don't like to spend money unless I have to. And it was one of those things like I, to this day, to this day, I still have never owned a brand new car. I've always bought a used car, that type of thing, even though I could walk out and buy one tomorrow. Uh, just because I don't see the value in owning a brand new versus I could buy a one-year-old car. And that's what I did last time. Before that, I was always like a 10-year-old car. Uh, so living very frugal, cutting all expenses we could, and then using the little bit of reserves. And when I say a little bit, like we probably had maybe a couple thousand dollars in the bank. She had a steady job. Uh, and I just had to work, 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 and get the store up and running. Luckily for me, it we signed two days before Christmas, and we had the store open in April. So it took four months, four months off of one income, basically. And the good thing was, because I had ran a store and worked in one for five years, I was profitable from the first month on because I knew who to order from, I knew what to order, I knew what to stock, I knew what would probably sell, all these things. And uh, so yeah, profitable. And I, I was only paying myself, I think the first six months, I started paying myself $500 a month. And then after that, it went to 1000 And that was like for a year. And then it kind of went up from there. I mean, now I have to pay myself a certain way because when you become a million dollar company, if I'm not paying myself with the way my business is structured, they can look at it like tax evasion because I'm not paying enough to social security and all that. So there's a, a rate that I, you know, if you paid yourself too little, they go, hey, what are you doing here? Uh, so we're avoiding that problem, but I still don't pay myself nearly what I could pay myself. Uh, and that's because I invested all back into the business. Um, you know, just like the aquatic experience, something like that event cost. So those of you that know us from the fish part, if you don't know us, we went to a fish convention between myself and my employee that I brought with me and the shirts we gave away and the car rentals, the plane tickets, the hotel room, uh, buying dinners and all that kind of stuff. We invested about $10,000 into that event and we brought nothing to sell. So that was like a $10,000 give back to the community type of thing where if I had not flown out, that's just 10,000, well, 7,500 in my pocket, right? Cause I'm a 75% owner. Um, so we spend a lot of money towards that kind of stuff where it definitely grows the business bigger long term but in the short term is cannibalizing income and so uh yeah it's definitely a hard thing but the best thing i think you could do is get your chops work in another fish store go make your 12 bucks an hour whatever it's going to be learn to live off that income and hopefully a spouse's income or a significant other or someone that's willing to support you while you launch that business and uh, when you can live off that, it's easier for someone else to cover you. Because if I, if I was to leave a job where I was like, oh, man, I'm making $35 an hour and I've got a certain car payment and a house payment and all these things, I don't know that I could have made that leap. So, All right. Uh, always have a car payment either to a bank or a mechanic. That's true, except like... So far in my life, I have paid way less to mechanics than I have for a new car, and I run the numbers quite often because there are very big tax advantages to me buying a big dummy SUV or a utility vehicle. So a big truck, big transit connect, anything that weighs more than five tons, I get to write off in one business year as a tax write-off, very lucrative. I can buy a Lincoln Navigator with spinners, and I can write it off all this year, but it doesn't make any sense long term. And so like right now we drive, we toured the country in a 2000 uh, Chrysler town and country that we've had in the family for a very long time. And is now we also went and picked up 2000 pounds of sand and 3000 pounds of liquid fertilizer and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and I spent my money there instead of spending $35,000 on a new transit connect and for some people, maybe it makes sense, but at least here in Washington, from the numbers I see and the numbers I run, it way outpaces for me to use older vehicles than brand new vehicles. So, uh, let's see here. People invest in people. That's a very true statement. Uh, you see that a lot in people that have money. They either think you are really 
a go-getter basically or not what how good the idea is is not as important so even like even right now if i said all right guys i've got the best idea ever for a stationary company and you're like stationary like people only write emails and do that kind of stuff and if i really kept talking about it and i was like no i've got this idea someone would put money into me just because they're going i see what you did in this other industry and if you put that much time and energy you may not be successful and profit in insane amounts but i can't see you really losing my money either and then conversely like if you made a youtube channel and blew up becoming pen pals and stationary and all that kind of stuff maybe it's the next million dollar idea i'm willing to invest in that you might be able to pull that off not crazy about the stationary idea but i'm crazy about being able to invest this amount of money to get this amount of return possibly so all righty business leasing is the best way to go maybe it makes a lot of sense uh on paper for sure but i i do business different than other people so everything in my business is paid for in cash not like i physically hand you like oh yeah let me buy these fluval lights here's seven thousand dollars in 20s but i pay with a credit card and it gets paid off every single day so my entire business all the equipment the warehouse everything in the warehouse everything in the retail store is outright paid for the business owes nothing to anyone uh whereas leasing is a good idea well i'm not gonna say it's a good idea it is tax uh advantageous the problem is most businesses fold from lack of liquid cash so either a i could buy like a ford transit or b i could lease one it is more tax beneficial really for me to lease it that being said if the economy changes or my business changes or something like that in six months, I'm locked into that lease and I have less liquid asset, right? Now you're going, well, it's just, it's only like another three or 400 bucks a month, right? But usually if you're going to go down the mindset of, well, lease is a good thing pretty soon. Well, I'm leasing a car. Well, let's lease another car. Like for instance, one of my employees, uh, we need to lease a bigger vehicle to pick up more stuff from the airport because our shipments are getting that big. And so your line of logic starts going down, well, we'll lease this and this and this and this. And now all of a sudden you might have two or $3,000 a month of stuff you're leasing that is not really liquid anymore. Where my, my, my business practices, and I, I realize what I do is not optimal, but it's what's optimal for me. Like my entire goal is once I completely pay off my house in this building and I'm 100% like that's the only thing in my life I owe money on in my entire business my cars my wife's cars well not cars now she owns like a bunch of cars but like all of our vehicles the only thing we owe money to anyone in this world is is to our mortgage because it is kind of a benefit to do that plus I don't have a few hundred thousand dollars just lying around to go yeah let's just kick that out and be done with it but that is so I am a guy that wants to pay off his house in the next five years or less uh, because the mental freedom of actually owning this piece of property is very big to me. And so that if my business was to fold two days from now, or not two days, but two years from now and I paid off my house, really it doesn't affect me. Once you've paid off your house and I can go get any job and I can really make it. And when mentally when i'm freed up of owning everything and owing no one any money i'm truly free to make the decisions in my business that benefit my mental health and my customers the most i'm not making decisions based on cash flow or oh i gotta meet this quota to satisfy my investors or anything like that i can truly be free but right now i would have to work because i have to make sure i can pay my mortgage when that's gone I could truly do whatever I feel is in my best interest to what I'm interested in. So, uh, do you think there is a way to make a living breeding fish on a mid to large scale, like a hundred tanks, a few thousand gallons? Is it possible to sell uh, to a wholesaler that way? 
I think that comes down to where you live because space costs money, electric water costs money, and then do you have the wholesalers to sell to or the stores to sell to? Uh, I would say if you want to know, watch people like uh, L.R. Bretz. He's pretty much breeding all his own stuff. He's building a lot of infrastructure. He sells stuff, but on the whole, is he profiting to support himself and his family? That I don't know. You'd have to ask him. But I would wager after a few years, you either A, stop doing it, or B, it is profitable. Um, I know, well, I won't say I know. I don't think it's uh, that good of an idea for someone in Seattle, but it might be great in Montana or Idaho or, you know, Kentucky. I don't know. They're like, there's other spots where it makes more sense sometimes. So, uh, yeah, I do need a helicopter so I can say get to the chopper. Yeah, that's, uh, you know. So, Tori Cook, oh, that's right. I think you sent me some stuff. Uh, I don't think, well, I'm not going to say I don't think you could, but I think with minimum wage being where it's going to go to and is and what our property's worth, I think you're going to have to do a lot more work than someone who lives in Idaho. So it's one of those things like you might consider relocation. I do know breeders that are making some money, but at the same time, they make money at their day job way more. Like they're doing it, they make money, but their profession, you know, and that might be a better anal or a better thing to think about is like you'd have to be so efficient at running this fish room to make money in Washington that if you can pull that off, you should just run a different business. It'll be easier and more profitable. You know, whereas if you were somewhere else, it might make a lot of sense going, oh, overhead's super low, labor's cheap, I got a kid down the road that comes in, we've got a big fish club, all these things going for me. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious why it would make more sense in different areas if you were to ship fish. Uh, let's be real, Washington is ridiculous. Why it would make more sense in different areas? Well, for one, go to Arizona and your tax structure structure changes and it's way easier to do business. Same with Nevada. So there's tax structure. Uh, if you're in the Midwest and you're shipping United States wide, it's shorter distances to ship. It's easier to bargain for cheaper shipping. In general, water and power is cheaper. For sure, land is cheaper, which means warehouse space or whatever you're going to buy is cheaper. Gas is cheaper. Uh, saddle up to uh, an international airport and you're pretty much good to go. Like, we have an international airport, but it's crazy bit, crazy expensive to live here. So, uh, let's see. Montana, for sure, we have nothing. It's true. You guys barely have the internet. You know, that's that's something I couldn't do is, uh, you know, I would need a strong internet infrastructure to really make my business the way it thrives now continue to thrive. So, uh, let's see. Did you ever imagine that you'd eventually be impacting tens of thousands of people through this business? Uh, no. I I thought that I would... Um, I honestly thought that I if, I if I did what I was planning to do, I would just dominate the state of Washington. Like, everyone in the state of Washington would be like, Aquarium Co-op is the place to go. That's... That was, you know, that was, oh man, Grand Slam, out of the park, amazing, done my job. Uh, and then it stagnated, right? So, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't want to be conceited enough to say, like, yeah, I have that reputation. But definitely the aquarium co-op is up there. People like to go to my store. So I, I view it as like, okay, I'm doing a good thing. We, we made it. Uh, but then what happened was, uh, perfect example, sales stagnated. Like, okay, in the retail store, we can only really get to this. And then a year later, I got 10% more. And a year later, I got like, nine percent more that's when i decided to go online with youtube and do all that kind of stuff and then you so well you guys may not know that but i went uh so my business for instance just in this last year uh, i'm up 225 percent and current projections for next year uh based on growth and stuff like that is my business will grow by 163 percent and so i was struggling in a retail store to grow by 10 percent if i was lucky to 
and really that would be like 110%. So uh, to growing much, much, much more than that online. And that was the path of least resistance. I could spend a lot of money and a lot of time to squeak out 10 more percent. That would be like shipping fish or go down this entirely different avenue that turned out to be very profitable. So that's where, like, honestly, and this is, you know, between me and me and the rest of the internet here, this little secret, uh, if Aquarium Co-op is going to do another major expansion, I say if, we'll become a media production company. That means me, Jimmy, a few other people, we will produce videos and work with people to produce content and help YouTube channels and Facebook channels, stuff like that, grow, make commercials and content for other companies. Because we've developed the skill, we have the ability to go, oh, tomorrow, you'd like to make a video for that? Yeah, let's let's think of something cool and funny to do. We've got all the equipment. We, we can film it in a million different ways. We can do all these things. We can put it together. And yeah, it's just going to cost you this, and we'll be done by Sunday. You know, that sounds great. Because like even at my dentist today, uh, they were struggling so much with their social media and stuff like that. I'm thinking, you know, what you're trying to do is like way back, like you're five years behind and someone like me and Jimmy, okay, you want to accomplish this and get people to think you're a cool dentist and people should come see you. Like we can just do that way better than what you're envisioning. And so like for me, they're giving away something like 16 giveaways and they're giving away $300 gift cards to grocery stores to grow their business. So I'm thinking that's kind of a lot of money. You're giving a lot of money where we could do other things like why don't we get on your Facebook page and do Q&A and talk about how you're an awesome dentist and you can uh, you know, deal with people who have anxiety and all these kinds of things and do that, like spend the money there. But they're you know, trying to get people to answer trivia questions and do all these things and then they give that away. And it's just it, – it's, it's a way of marketing for sure. But I think we could help a lot of businesses – Go, you know, I think if we gave them a taste of it, they'd be like, yeah, we should just do more of that. That worked out way better than the 75 people that show up every week to try and win that $300 gift certificate when we could have made this video and, oh, 2,400 people watched that and we got seven new clients or whatever. So, uh, let's see here. Please don't rap. <laughs> I don't plan. Well, I won't say I don't plan it. I, I would, it would be funny to make a rap, but. Uh, I, don't, I don't have no plans on doing it. Do you think that YouTube and social media in general was the way to go before you went into business or after the fact? So it would have been better for me to get on social media before I ever opened my business for sure. Uh, and I am convinced there's not a single business out there that shouldn't be on social media. Like every, everything in life could be turned into a show. And I think that was really demonstrated by like uh, Dirty Jobs, the series. Some of the best episodes were like, oh, you, you own a, a porta potty company or you own this. Like it was interesting. And you can, like, even if I owned a porta potty company and you're going, well, what, what could be interesting about porta potties? Oh, 4th of July, seven of them got blown up with fireworks. That's seven videos right there. The rest of the time, maybe you're going, oh, well, it's winter. Four of them froze in Wisconsin. It was crazy. Let me show you that. Uh, and then you could be like, check it out. We bought a $130,000 truck because that one blew up. And then you can just talk about business as general, you know, and that kind of thing. So you could take almost any business. You could even be like, well, I run, I run you know, a brothel in Nevada. I'm confident you wouldn't have to make it just be like, oh, here's half naked girls on the internet. You could just talk about business, clients, uh, what it's like to run one, that type of thing, and it would work, you know? So I'm, I'm confident every business could have a great social media presence if they found the way to frame it and they actually believed in it. Most businesses don't believe in it. Like, you might go, well, I'm just a plumber. Why? Why would I want to be big on social media? Because if you were the biggest plumber on social media, you would charge 70% more than you're charging right now, even though you're only ever going to work in Washington because you've pre-qualified the customer of, oh my God, you're that plumber from the internet. So uh, let's see.
LR Brett Swamps makes a book called Porta Potty Art from all the different drawings and things people write in them. There you go. Like that itself, if you owned a Porta Potty company, is a weekly video. Look what we, you know, so I do unboxings on my channel, right? We unbox fish. All you'd have to do is once a week go, look what we found in a Porta Potty. Turns out that possum drowned. Turns out someone drew this. Turns out, you know, like you would tune in just to be like, well, that's crazy. Never thought about that. And that is what the public finds interesting, what we don't know. Like, huh, who knew that one out of four porta potties had a drowned rat in it? Didn't know. But if you own a porta potty company, that's just a known fact or whatever. You know, all that mundane stuff when you own a business is what is interesting to people that don't own that business. Hmm. We got anything else to talk about before? How long? We, we've been going probably too long. That's what I know. Probably too long. I already know I'm going to link this video and people are going to be like, an hour and 12 minutes. I ain't watching why he doesn't ship fish. Uh, let's see. Montana is in a rough way after the fires last summer. Oof. Yeah. Yeah, there's another uh, environmental factor. You know, California's got that problem. Got water issues there. Yeah. I think that's it. You know, it's already ten, it's already after ten in my time, and I think I remember a while ago saying it's eight thirty and I'm still working or something or nine thirty, and now it's ten eleven. So clearly, I've been yammering on for a while. But uh, hit me up with you guys' questions. I do like talking business. This is one of those facets that makes me no money. Uh, it's purely for mental exercise and helping people and just having some fun. And I do get good ideas from you guys as well. Like sometimes I explain something and I'm like, yeah, that was a good idea. I should do that. Yeah. Why don't, why don't I think of that? Well, I would have went down that path without talking to you guys. So, uh, let's see. We've seen the effect of your decision to hire Jimmy on our end. What differences have you seen on my end? Uh, retention rates in YouTube has gone up, uh, having a personal assistant. So while Jimmy is an editor, he's also a personal assistant. It's someone who's basically with me all the time. And so it can be like, don't forget, uh, we need to do this. And it's one more person to hopefully not forget. Um, the other, I would say, not the downside, but everything I do costs twice as much. You know, like we went to the Shed Aquarium to film. Like, oh, it's $40 a ticket. Sweet. Give me two of those. Oh, we need to go to Chicago. Sweet. Give me two $500 plane tickets. So everything gets exponentially more expensive uh, on top of a salary, obviously. Um but it's definitely been good. He's been putting in good work, putting in good time, and uh, he'll grow right along with the rest of us here at Aquarium Co-op. And I'm sure, you know, we always joke about it, but I'm sure at some point Jimmy will have a Jimmy. So I have Jimmy, but at a certain point we'll need Jimmy to have a Jimmy where it's like I tell Jimmy to do something, he delegates some of that work, especially if we start working with other clients. And, you know, we were already doing three channels, and he's doing his own channel. We've got a lot of things in the, in the wheelhouse and a lot of things were, you know, building on and at a certain point they'll start coming to fruition and uh, we'll need just more people with skill sets that we have but can't spend all the time to do so uh let's see how did i come to figure out one hour is just right for my live streams uh i don't know that they're actually just right so two hours seems to be too long i actually think a perfect amount of time is actually about 12 minutes the problem is I'm not doing this for money. So if I was really trying to monetize it, 12 minutes is about where you want to be on a live stream. But when it comes to connecting with my fans and user base and helping people, more time the better. Um, but one hour is something I can stay committed to. Two hours was a bit much um, with our current work schedule. So that's how I kind of came up to that. Uh, if I'm trying to breed, for profit, create my own line of certain cichlids. Would it be smart to invest in multiple tanks for breeding and grow? So equipment first or start very small and expand as you go? I would start very small. You can always buy equipment, um, but you don't always need more equipment. And a lot of times, you force yourself to be more efficient by not having the equipment. Every once in a while, yeah, you're technically limited, but that's so rare to actually run into. It's mostly, uh, um, you know... Uh, do you really want to make it happen type of thing? So, 
All right. Well, now that we're getting all sappy with Jimmy and uh, Jimmy's ego is now inflated to here, it's a good time to end before I, you know, before I, before I say anything dumb and uh, put my foot in my mouth. But yeah. So thanks for hanging out, guys. Leave comments. The comments are what motivate me. Like, yeah, I could talk about that. This whole show came from answering why I don't ship fish or not answering, but going, oh, God, I got the question again. Uh, so I came over here to answer it. What's up? Uh, I don't want to commit to eight hours, but there is definitely a long live stream. Highly likely to be eight hours, but until I sit down and I say, I'm here for eight hours, I don't want to commit to that because I don't know specifically if my grandmother's coming over for Thanksgiving. I think it's going to start at 8 a.m. Pacific, which means I'm done at 4 p.m., which is plenty in time for dinner, but I don't want to commit to that without... Um, without, you know, that's not like a game time decision. Like the night before, like, yeah, Jimmy, you feeling good? All right, we're doing eight hours. Let's do this. Um, so, yeah, you know, I would guess bare minimum four, maximum eight. That's my guess. Uh, and, yeah, there will be, um, you know, sales and deals and, and presents and prizes and all those types of things because that's what you do in the social media live streams. Um but yeah, so thanks for hanging out. I got more work I got to get done and more prep for actually Thanksgiving and Black Friday and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I'm going to work on that and leave your comments and questions below. And hopefully you make it one step further in your business until we talk next time.